Hello and welcome to the program. Joining us is Lawrence David Folders. He's a member of the Executive Committee at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to, thank you. Uh, so you just came back from uh, Kiev Media Week and uh, you've been at the Ukrainian Film School as well at the, uh, the UA Studios. Uh, so before we begin talking about films, uh, what's your impression been so far of Ukraine during this visit? I'm very um, pleasantly surprised, um, both with the country itself, um, with the facilities, uh, film facilities here, and with the talent of filmmakers, young filmmakers, production personnel here. But I was expecting, because I have never been in Ukraine before, mm -hmm. and I was expecting this sort of dreary um, <laughs> post-Soviet um, vibe and things. And it's anything but that. It's vibrant. It's lively. Um, I really enjoy being here. And you went to the UA Film Studios as well, and uh, you gave a, a talk there, which uh, you didn't have enough time for, unfortunately, a lot of questions. You know, when you're talking about producing and directing and, uh, and then the Academy and, and so forth, there's a lot of stuff to cover, and it's very difficult to cover that in just uh, a couple of hours. Mm. So, but I really like the, uh, the UA Studios because they have, um, especially the back lot, the back lot's really cool. The, uh, the fortress, the, um, uh, the valley there. Uh, because I, the film studios are huge, aren't they? They're well, just a never-ending, well, to me, it's like a never-ending maze of just different rooms, different yes, scenes. Yes, It's, um, it's uh, definitely a little bit smaller than what we have in Los Angeles as far as 20th Century Fox or Paramount <laughs> yes. or Universal. But uh, it's a pretty good facility, I have to say, and I really do like the authenticity and originality of the sets and, um, and also the attitudes of everybody working there. There's a really good um, energy and uh, artistic, creative energy that exists there. Yeah, and one of the key themes that you were talking about during your lecture to the students was the role of producers and directors in films. Now, your career goes back uh, several decades. I won't say how many, just to be polite. <laughs> but um, can you explain, for the audience who are perhaps not aware, what is the difference in the particular responsibilities of the producers and directors in film? Well, I try to make it, you know, in a very basic way. The producer's job is overseeing the entire financial side and administration side of a motion picture. So um, everything to do with contracting, legal issues, financing, um, uh, hiring, uh, equipment companies, negotiations, uh, all of these things fall in the producer's area. The director's side is to oversee the entire creative aspect of the motion picture. And when I say motion picture, television and other entertainment oh, so media. Then, yeah. yeah. So, so the director's responsible for all of the talent, the director's responsible for the crew, um, for making everybody, ensuring that everybody who works on the film works together on the same film, mm -hmm. not everybody thinking they're doing something different, yeah. um, and to get those people to deliver the vision that the director wants, the Is, director wants I mean, to give to the audience. In, in your experience, has that been quite difficult to get every member of the team, not just the producer, the director, but also the guy who's behind the camera, uh, the guy who's uh, looking at the, the TV screen, uh, everyone else in the background to have the same vision of what the film is going to be like? <clears throat> okay. There is the director with his or her vision. And that vision stems from the script. And so taking that script and interpreting it, putting the director's own imprint on it, and then um, making that vision, creating that vision, and putting it on the screen for the audience. Everybody on the film has a, their own agenda in some way. Mm -hmm. So cinematographers are wonderful, but they oftentimes, and I'm not saying all the time, but oftentimes <laughs> will um, want to make every shot as beautiful as possible mm -hmm. or as cool looking as possible because they're thinking of that footage going on their reel. <laughs> okay? They're not necessarily looking at the whole picture. The same thing with the costume designer, art director. Um, I mean, I can talk about a lot of people down the line, but it has to work within the whole framework of the film. 
And all of their positions, all everything that they do, have to serve the vision of the director. So it's not an easy job um, coordinating and managing all of these people. And I, I don't like to use this word because it has a negative connotation, mm -hmm. but a director must be a manipulator. <laughs> I, I, hate, I hate to use that. And the same thing a producer must be at as well, because you have to manipulate everybody mm. that you're working with, that you come in contact with, to get them to deliver what you need. And you have to do it in such a way that they don't know they're being manipulated. So, so obviously you're quite good at this then? <laughs> you could say so. I, I you know, I, I hope that I am. <laughs> you know, but that the, means obviously then that the director is under a lot of pressure to make sure that the vision is right for the distribution companies who are going to sell the film or perhaps for the, the cinemas who are going to show this film. I, I feel that the director has to focus only um, when directing on getting that vision on the screen, not worrying about what the distributor thinks, not worrying about what the um, audiences, all, that kind of thing. A director's job is actually um, twofold in that the director has, um, has to handle the whole emotional side. So there's an emotional aspect of directing, mm -hmm. and then there's a technical aspect of directing. So um, the emotional is working with the actors and getting them to give the performances that, that you need. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, a director also has to be a um, psychologist, a confidant, um, policeman, parent, mm -hmm. teacher, uh, drinking buddy, <laughs> all of those kind of things. Uh, on the technical side, the director has to understand uh, cinematography. The director has to understand um, all of the technical aspects of the film in order to be able to manage all of those things. So it's it's a it's not an easy job, um, but um, I I enjoy doing it. And how did you learn these different skills? Was it just through experience, or were there people that you looked up to in your past, perhaps when you went to film school? Well. I, I um, this goes back, I guess, to when I was a child, because um, um, it, my, gra my grandfather, my parents came to uh, the U.S. Um, from Hungary in 1956. Uh, they left in the revolution. And they brought with them my grandfather on my father's side and my um, mother's childhood nanny. Mm -hmm. And the older folks never spoke any English. My parents were busy working every day. In, uh, in, in the office, so I was pretty much raised a lot by my grandfather and mm -hmm. my mother's nanny. And every day after school, my grandfather would meet me out front of the elementary school, and instead of going home, we would go down to Hollywood Boulevard. I remember we would take the 91 bus, and we would go down to see movies, two, three movies a day, every day, five days a week. Wow. So um, I really, my love of filmmaking came from that. And I would sit in the back row with him, and because he was hard of hearing and didn't speak English, um, I would translate the movies into Hungarian for him. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I just changed the whole storyline and all that. So yeah. I think that's where my love of storytelling started. But um, after going through school, I only had one year of um, college, uh, one year of high school, and then I went straight to college. And I graduated when I was 18. And uh, so I went through film school, two different film schools, and I, had, I was very lucky to have two different, um, very important mentors mm. while I was in film school. One was my directing mentor, uh, Sandy McKendrick, who directed um, Sweet Smell of Success and uh, The Man in the White Suit. My cinematography mentor was a fellow named Chris Malkiewicz, who mm. uh, was Roman Polanski's early mm. cinematographer and yeah. wrote a book on lighting. So I learned a lot of the technicalities of that. Um, I also learned about production management and budgeting and scheduling. And then when I finished school, I decided I could go work in the mail room at an agency or I could work as a production assistant. Mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to make the first film. And, and I, um, how does it, I mean, film must change so fast, perhaps not the storytelling part of it, but the technical part of that as well. So how do you keep up with these different trends? I know before the interview you were saying that uh, in the old days, the uh, directors would never have a television screen in front of them, just watching it and making sure that there were no mistakes. They would actually look at the actors playing out the scene. And this is perhaps one change. So 
Um, how do you prefer to make films? Do you prefer it sort of with this new technology and computer graphics and all this sort of thing, or perhaps the old style way? Well, okay, I I, I came into the industry um, pretty much at the kind of tail end of the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I almost wish that I didn't, because everything changed, everything in the mid-80s changed to the way things are now. I don't think the change is necessarily for the better. But um, I think that a combination of doing, doing uh, of directing and producing old style with what's available um, in modern technology is the best way to go. I mean, I feel that, um, you know, now you see directors mm -hmm. and they're all sitting behind a monitor just looking at that monitor and, and yeah. just checking that. But in the so-called old days, the director sat next to the camera and had a direct um, personal line of sight and communication uh, connection with the actors and was there to support the actors. The act acting is a very, very difficult um, profession. Mm. I, 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 I'm, I'm always in awe of actors because they lay themselves bare in front of the camera. And so you um, need to, as a director, be there to support them. If you're not, then they have nowhere to turn. They, 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 they need that, that feeling of being coddled so, and cradled. So almost it's like the, the actors just don't turn up on the set and they say, I know the role, I know how it should look like. Actually, in some respects, it's the other way, where the director says, OK, you do this and I'll help you do it. Well, OK, there are directors who, um, you know, direct and who tell an actor, OK, on this line, walk over here, sit down, pick up this pencil, say this line, mm -hmm. do this. I don't agree with doing things that way. Um, I feel that um, I like to see what an actor brings to the table because um, otherwise they're just a robot for you. Mm. And everybody who comes to the film brings something creatively to it. Otherwise, why should I bring them on the film? I want to bring people who are going to take my vision a step further yeah. and enhance that vision and bring their own creativity to it. Okay. So with actors, I like to have them come onto the set and I don't tell them what to do at all. And I had one actress, the leading actress in, a, in a, one of my last films, who was like, tell me what to do. <laughs> and I said, no, I want to see what you do. Yeah. And, because I like to see how they move, where they move on the set, what they do. Um, that's what comes naturally to them. I think that's interesting, sort of this, instead of having a, a vertical line where the director's at the top and then you have the producers and actors at the bottom, actually it's very much horizontal, you could say, where everyone pitches in and they bring in their creative ideas. Well, I think that that's, that's the best way because, okay, you know, it is not, I have to say, that, that uh, filmmaking um, is not a uh, democracy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> filmmaking is a dictatorship. However, uh, because there can be only one vision, mm. but it's a collaboration between, between everybody. And I like to say that directing is more about adjustment than it is about giving specific direction. I give the camera specific direction, I give technical issues specific direction, but when I'm dealing with the, with the emotion, with the performances, I like to see what the actors do on the set, and then I will discuss it with the cinematographer, with lighting, with the sound department, see if it works technically. If, it, if there are issues where, let's say, they, they back up too close against the wall and mm. it doesn't work for the lighting, I'll adjust them, I'll move them a bit, or I'll adjust their performance in, in ways. But I want to leave as much of what is natural, what comes to them naturally, because another reason is that a lot of people don't realize that when you're filming, you have to film a take over and over again. You have to do multiple takes, yeah. plus you're shooting a scene from numerous angles, and each angle has to match. So once you have your master shot, and an actor has done a certain amount of things mm. in that master shot, they have to repeat all of those things over and over again. Oh, so it has to be exactly the same. There exact can't be any small differences. Exactly the same. So if I leave their performance as natural as possible, if they're going to pick up this glass mm. on a particular word, okay, they're going to do that over and over again if that's what they instinctively did. But if I tell them to do it on a different word, mm then they're always going to be thinking in their mind to be sure that they get it on that word. 
at that time. Instead of focusing on the energy, the emotion, and the motivation of that character. And this is why you also said that you don't let actors or actresses actually watch any of the scenes that you film until the film is almost released. I think it's the biggest mistake of, uh, of directors who allow actors to, um, to see their performance during the filming. And why is that? Um, well, okay. <clears throat> First of all, it slows everything down. Because when you record a take, and then everybody after every take goes over to the monitor and looks at it, and they mm. all want to watch it, and they all pick and, pick and talk <laughs> about it and everything, it literally doubles the production time. I mean, literally takes away 50% of your shooting time that you would otherwise have. Secondly, um, and more importantly when it comes to the actors, they look at their little quirks, their details about themselves. And if they don't like something that they're doing, suddenly in the middle of a performance, they'll change it. And you can never get the actor to go back again. So it's very important for the director to keep the actor's emotion, uh, the actor's performance consistent from beginning to end. And, um, and they have to trust that the director is guiding them in the right way. Mm. Well, that's very interesting. I actually wanted to move on as well and talk more about psychology in film. I know this is something you're interested in. And um, you have significant knowledge in sort of uh, human behavior as well as internal medicine, all this, uh, this sort of subject. So I wanted to ask, um, is it possible to describe how psychology is used in films in general? What sort of tricks perhaps filmmakers use to make the audience more attached to the film that they're watching? Well, there is again, the, when you talk about these tricks or psychology, there's the uh, technical side of, of certain things, and then there's again the, um, uh, the mindset side, the emotional side of things. So um, I've always been interested in, in, in psychology because I think it's a direct connection. Understanding psychology is extremely important as a director because you have to understand the psychology of the audience as well as the performers that you're dealing with because in order to get a certain performance from them you have to again like I said before manipulate them manipulate their mind yeah. so you have to know how the mind works and you have to understand the people that you're dealing with the actors you're dealing with you have to understand their weaknesses um, their their passions uh, and these things so that you can guide them to to give that performance so I think that understanding how people, um, how their emotions work is, is critical. Yeah. On the technical side, there are a number of things that, that you can do as far as um, uh, getting the audience to feel a certain way. Okay, can so, you give us the secrets? Well, oh. uh, you know, camera angles, of course, are, yeah. are, are one thing. Um, as an example, if you place the camera, if you're, you're photographing someone, and you place the camera lower hmm. than eye level. So instead of at eye level, you place it lower than eye level. Automatically, that character is more powerful. Okay? Oh, because they're taller. The, I mean, Not the because they're taller. The, okay, yeah. let's say we have two people in a scene. Okay. Okay, one person is intimidating the other person. Yeah. Okay, if you place the camera lower, that person already has an advantage and in intimidation over the other character. For the weak character, you place the camera higher, so they appear to be um, weaker mm. and in, um, and this can be in subtleties. It doesn't have to be big, major changes, but it gives the impression to the audience already of, of um, a shift in uh, um, relationship between those two people. Um, a lot, there are a lot of other kinds of tricks that you can do. Lighting, mm. you know, I mean, if you want to make somebody evil, <laughs> you light them in such a way that uh, they're more shadowy, they're more um, um, striking. They kind of look more mysterious. Almost. Exactly, exactly. Of course, if you want to make somebody look the hero, they're always lit beautifully, they're always lit straight on and, 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 and uh, with the background a certain mm. way. So there are a lot of things like that you can do. And then there are tricks such as um, in lovemaking scenes. Mm. People think that there's a tremendous passion, let's say, yeah. uh, in a, in a lovemaking scene. And, uh, you know, the girl is 
digging her fingers into the back of her lover. Yeah. Um, I learned from the old pros that uh, you put uh, red lipstick under the girl's fingernails, so she kind of runs the fingers down his back <laughs> and it looks like she's digging them into his back, okay? Or uh, there are other kinds of tricks such as, um, I was doing a scene which we had, had to take place in the summertime. And um, unfortunately, because of scheduling issues, we weren't able to shoot that scene until winter. Mm -hmm. And it was cold outside, and it was the moment that the actors got on the set, it's supposed to be um, May, June. And then they open their mouth, you see their <laughs> breath, yep. okay? Well, there's a way to deal with that, which is you actually give the actors, just before each take, a bucket with ice cubes. Really? And, and the works? actors have to suck on the ice cube mm -hmm. um, for a minute or two, and then they can do the take because it lowers the mouth temperature down so that you don't get the breath. And you can keep going with the shot until you start getting breath and you have to stop and mm. suck on the ice cube again. <laughs> That's so clever. <laughs> I didn't even know about this. There, there are a lot of tricks and a lot of these things you don't learn in film school. You learn um, when you make the film. I mean, I learned more on making the first film, Malibu High, mm. than all the time I did in film school. And, uh, and from, especially from old pros and old masters. And I think I was reading an article actually about uh, Alfred Hitchcock, how he was the, the master of suspense and how sometimes it's actually not just important what's on screen, but also what is off screen as well and what's being kept behind the viewer. Do you, do you use this in your films or not so much? Well, um, this, you know, when you want to build suspense, okay, Oftentimes in the mind, what somebody thinks in their mind, not really knowing or seeing, is much more powerful psychologically, much more frightening than um, what you actually see. So Hitchcock was a master of this because a lot of the, um, the terror, a lot of the fear, were things that happened off screen and the audience didn't see it. Mm. But, um, so, so the audience's imagination went wild and went crazy thinking, what could it be? And oftentimes, you know, that's far more terrifying than, than what you really see. Uh, one of these things was evident uh, not too long ago in the film Paranormal Activity. Mm. Um, you didn't see very much, but you were frightened. And that's because of using that technique of keeping things off screen. If you expose everything, then there's nothing to, be, to think about to be afraid of. Mm. I always think it's very interesting in film as well how um, the film tries to relate to the audience's own experiences and their own emotions. And uh, there's, there was another article I was reading about why people cry when they watch films. And perhaps it's not just about the scene itself, whether it's a goodbye scene or heartbreak or someone on a deathbed or, or something like this, uh, something traumatic. Actually, it's about the, their own experiences often. And so how, in your films in the past, how have you got the audience to try and relate to the film itself, say with Malibu High, mm -hmm. or your later films even? Well, it, it's, in, it's in building the characters. Um, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the characters because you want to make the characters um, real when you're creating them. And so that audiences can relate to them. When somebody in the audience has a character that they relate to, then they're naturally going to feel drawn to that character. Um, I tell young filmmakers and screenwriters, especially first-time ones, that um, oftentimes the biggest mistake I see in screenplays is that people, uh, all the characters sound the same. Mm. All the dialogue sounds the same. That's because one person wrote all of that. Yeah. And so everybody is going to sound the same. So you need to give individual characters to each, each of the people who inhabit that screenplay. And what I tell people to do is to, when you have a character, think about somebody that you know. So think about um, a parent, a friend, a sibling, um, an uncle, co-worker, or somebody that you hate. Mm. And assign the personality of one of those people to your character. And then think, when you're coming up with the dialogue, think about how would that person in that particular situation, what would they say and how would they react? And so now you have characters that are real and that are alive. Mm. Um, 
I think that uh, it's essential that the filmmaker connect with the audience and make them engage in the film and in the characters because that's the way in which you're able to move their emotions and to touch them and to um, get them to give you the reactions that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I, even last night I was watching a, a British detective series and it was just so interesting how they were following all the characters around and how, you know, when you start to dissect these films, you think, well, why did I react like that? Or why do I feel sorry for this guy? Mm -hmm. And it's all these techniques that they use in the films, mm -hmm. like you, you spoke about. Um, I want to ask you about um, uh, your favourite films. Do you have favourite films at all? Perhaps one that you look up to that you think was a masterpiece? Well, I get asked that question a lot. Yeah. And for me, it's actually, I have more favorite directors as opposed to specific okay. films because I have film, directors whose films I really admire and whose films touch upon certain things that are of interest to me and that, that move me. Um, of course, you know, if you go back in, in, uh, to the classics, the films of David Lean mm. have... Um, continue to affect me every time I look at them. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, um, Bridge on the River Kwai, uh, Gandhi. I mean, we're looking at, you know, uh, a master filmmaker. Mm. Um, there was a filmmaker named Franklin Schaffner, who in the 60s and 70s did um, films that were so varied yet moved you. He directed the original Planet of the Apes. Mm. He directed uh, Papillon with Steve McQueen and uh, Dustin Hoffman. And then he directed the film Patton with George C. Scott, um, giving each of them a unique uh, voice in it. Sam Peckinpah is another director that I admire tremendously with his style mm. um, and his uh, boldness in filmmaking. Um, in recent years, I have to say that there was a film that touched me a great deal, uh, a film called Never Let Me Go mm. with uh, Kira Knightley and um, Carey Mulligan. Um, it was a very interesting film about, uh, that took place, a science fiction story that took place in the past. Okay. So um, it took place in the 1950s when, uh, but in the 1950s they had already perfected cloning. Mm. Very interesting story. Okay. Well, um, Frey, we don't have, two, we have about five minutes left. Uh, so I want to ask you about your, your work at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences as yes. well, and particular, particularly about the foreign film section. Mm -hmm. um, how do you judge foreign films apart from each other, given the fact that a lot of them are perhaps culturally different, perhaps you see them just from your perspective rather than other people's perspective? Uh, how is that possible to judge films like that? Well, okay, you know, there isn't a, um, a checklist of, uh, <laughs> of criteria. Uh -huh. uh, we have guidelines, and, 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 but it... It always comes down to whether it's a foreign film or whether it's a domestic film, it's about excellence in filmmaking, excellence in storytelling, excellence in um, engaging with the audience. So it has nothing to do with the culture or where the film is from. Um, it has to do with if it moves us as a filmmaker and as a viewer. Um, last year was some very particular, very interesting examples um, the film A Fantastic Woman, which won uh, the best foreign language film, mm -hmm. dealt with a very um, difficult issue about uh, transgender people and what they face in, um, in the real world, what they face with um, prejudice and mm -hmm. uh, racism and so forth. That was a very topical film, but it was also a, a moving film. Mm -hmm. um, there was a film, a beautiful film from uh, Nepal, called White Sun, which dealt with um, two different cultures and how they had to overcome uh, their differences for the better good. Mm. Um, beautifully shot for less than $200,000. Um, there was a film from South Africa called The Wound, mm. which dealt with um, the very controversial subject of bringing um, um, the rite of passage for boys into men mm. and um, how they deal with the issue when um, homosexuality comes into play. So it really is the stories themselves that sell you? Story is always the first thing, mm. okay? Because if you don't have a great story, then no matter what bells and whistles you put on it, it's still going to be a mediocre story 
uh, beautifully photographed or, or, mm -hmm. or presented. It has to be um, the story first. There have been some incredible films, as we know in, in um, currently uh, uh, contemporary films, that look slick, that look beautiful, but that are empty, that, that are, are, have no significance whatsoever. And then there have been some incredibly, how should I say, some very primitively made films. Mm. But that doesn't matter because the emotion, what the story that they tell, moves you no matter how it's photographed or how much money was spent on it. So again, it's about story and about um, emotion. Mm. Well, that's perfect. I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for uh, coming into our studios. I, I love it. You're great, and I love, love being here in Kia. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, Lawrence David Folders. He's a member of the Executive Committee at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. You're watching UATV.